Welcome to our worship service today. We are so glad that you could join us this morning, and it is our prayer that you would experience the love and presence of God as you gather to worship with us today. Our call to worship this morning is going to be Psalm 119, verses 89 through 96. And this is the Word of God, and it says this, Your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation, as enduring as the earth you created. Your regulations remain true to this day, for everything serves your plans. If your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. I will never forget your commandments, for by them you give me life. I am yours. Rescue me. For I have worked hard at obeying your commandments. Though the wicked hide along the way to kill me, I will quietly keep my mind on your laws. Even perfection has its limits, but your commands have no limit. Let's just take a moment and uh, pray today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we have just heard read, your faithfulness extends to every generation and endures even as the earth you created. We thank you also that your regulations remain true to this day. God, you are indeed faithful and true. We give you praise today, Lord, because you are our God. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and because you raised him in power on the third day, you call us your people and you are not ashamed to be called our God. Let us live lives that uh, are worthy of you. Let us respond to you with worship and adoration and surrender. And uh, Lord, we ask today that you would draw us close to your heart. We pray that our allegiance would belong to Jesus Christ and none other. Forgive us when we serve lesser things in the great name of Jesus Christ. And fill us this day, O Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Bless our worship service today. In Jesus' name.
this morning's message is God's Victorious Weapon, Part 1. When we finished Revelation Chapter 9, we discovered something tremendously sobering. Not even the death of one-third of the world's population led to the repentance of those opposed to God, the Lamb, and the Church. We also learned that the first six trumpets were not consistent with the final judgment. These were indeed judgments poured out on the earth, uh, but they were preceding that final judgment that God would bring upon those who oppose him. So as we continue to live on this earth, there will be catastrophes that will be unable to change the hard hearts and the deceptive minds of God's enemies. They will continue in idolatry. They will continue to oppose God, the Lamb, and the Church. Revelation chapter 10 and 11 introduce us to God's victorious weapon against unrepentance. Today's message on Revelation chapter 10 will be part one of our study on this worthy topic. Part two will come next week when we look at Revelation chapter 11. As for right now, we are going to look at the text in Revelation chapter 10. The words will be on the screen today. This is the word of God, and it says this. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Keep secret what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. He said, there will be no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again. Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, and it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel, and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. May God bless the reading of his word today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, this text of scripture we have just uh, heard read. We pray that we would engage it from our souls, that our minds and our hearts and our wills would be uh, fully attentive to what it says. We thank you that the word of God is our authority, that it's living, that it's active. And we pray that you would use it today to conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ and to strengthen us as your church and your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the question we're going to set out to answer today is, uh, how does God introduce us to his victorious weapon against unrepentance? And uh, the first place we're going to start is here. God returns our attention to his ongoing faithfulness. Before God introduces his victorious weapon that will prompt repentance from those whose hearts remained unchanged from the first six trumpets, he sets out to remind his church of his ongoing faithfulness to them. In verse 1, an angel appeared who was surrounded by a cloud. In Exodus 19 and verse 9, we are told that the pillar of cloud was God's continuous presence 
with his people in the wilderness. It goes on to describe a rainbow over his head, reminding us of God's covenant faithfulness after the flood. We are told in scripture that he set a rainbow in the sky to remind him of the promise he made not to flood the whole earth again. Finally, verse 1 tells us that his face shone like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. Well, the fact that his face shone like the sun indicates uh, the glory of God. It speaks to uh, God's radiance and his glory uh, just, just from his presence. The Bible tells us that he dwells in unapproachable light. The pillar of fire here describing his feet is an echo from the exodus in the wilderness where God's presence led the people and remained with the people in the form of a pillar of fire. God wanted to clearly communicate that his presence and faithfulness were with the weak, disheartened churches that were wandering in the confusion and chaos of the world his own ongoing faithfulness would remain with them. There is a very real echo here between Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 10. Many believing the scroll described in Revelation 10 verse 2 is the same scroll that included God's unfolding plans of history in Revelation chapter 5. And in those plans, God indicated that he would remain faithful uh, to his people. But we also know from those plans that his unfolding plans for history would include both judgment and salvation. Uh, more on that in a moment. In fact, this mighty angel, either Jesus himself or his representative, stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Later in the book of Revelation, a beast would rise out of both the sea and the land. But God was sovereign over both the sea and the land, and therefore the beasts. The fact that he stands on top of them indicates his power and his sovereignty. He shouted, the angel, with the voice of a lion, symbolizing that he spoke on behalf of the Lion of Judah. All of this symbolism communicates one overarching truth. God's covenant faithfulness is with his people. Nowhere in scripture does God promise that we will be exempt from hardship and persecution. But throughout scripture, God promises to be so exceedingly faithful to his own, and he always follows through on that promise. Even as the world pours out its evil and hatred on the church, the God of all things is faithful to see her through. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, then scripture makes it clear that you will endure persecution in your godliness and faithful witness to the gospel. The temptation is to grow weary and give up when this happens. None of us uh, enjoy enduring any kind of hardship or persecution. In fact, the temptation goes a little further in that we want to uh, be like the world in the sense that the world around us seeks immediate gratification and the avoidance of pain. So in our walk with Jesus, one of the temptations that we can endure is, is this uh, continual desire to walk with Jesus Christ so long as there is no pain along the way. Instead, we are called to seek the pleasure of God, even amid pain, so that God can reward us with love, life, and liberty with Him forevermore. This morning, if you are struggling, perhaps in your workplace with an extended family member, with a neighbor, or with anybody in your life regarding matters of faith. Take heart. Yes, it's difficult to remain faithful, to have a faithful witness, to remain godly. 
But what needs to encourage us today, what needs to strengthen and empower us today, is the fact that God remains faithful to us. That idea of faithfulness is dependability, trustworthiness. God is with us, and we can depend on that. We can rely on that. We can be sure of that. Place our confidence in it. I hope this is an encouraging truth for you today. God is faithful to his people. The second way in which God introduces us uh, to his uh, victorious weapon against unrepentance is this. Displays of power and judgment will not change the hearts of the unrepentant. In this text, we are told of seven thunders. We can conclude that they are like the seven seals and the seven trumpets, in that uh, they were judgments on the people who stood opposed to God, the Lamb, and the church. But these seven thunders are left undisclosed. Tim Chester states that John is poised to catalog these calamities that these thunders will bring, just as he's done with the seals and trumpets. But the seven thunders are immediately rescinded. It's not clear why, but it may be because humanity didn't respond to the seals and trumpets with repentance. End quote. We know from 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that God does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But from the outcomes of Revelation chapter 9 through 11, we can conclude that judgment is not the weapon God will use to bring about victory with respect to changing the hearts of the unrepentant. We can see this in our world today. A global pandemic, Biblically, a modern-day plague is ravishing every corner of the earth. Its third wave has reached our nation and is unleashing its fury. Just today, I read on the news that in Quebec, it took the life of a teenager. And this sobers us. We, we, we see the impact of this virus throughout the world, this pandemic. And uh, it, uh, it leaves us unsettled. But it's not going to be COVID-19 that's going to lead many to repentance. So we need to ask ourselves this question. How can it be that a potent respiratory illness is not waking people up from their spiritual stupor to see and savor the glory of God in a life of faith and repentance? For the answer, let's look at Matthew 26, 53. In this text, Jesus is speaking to Peter, who has just struck one of the members of the mob who came to arrest Jesus. Jesus says to Peter in this verse, Don't you realize that I could ask my Father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly? Jesus could have revealed his identity in calling upon six legions of angels, or 6,000 angels. Such an army would have reduced Rome and the broken Jewish religious system to rubble in a moment. Jesus could have then promoted himself as the king he already is, and caused people to turn to God by his judgments on Rome and the religious elite. Instead, Jesus says in the very next verse of Matthew 26, these words, But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? And what did the scriptures say? Luke uh, chapter 24, 26 to 27 says this, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning 
himself. Jesus introduces us to God's victorious weapon. It is not calamity and judgment that will change the hearts of men and women, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, a victory accomplished through the suffering of Jesus Christ and his faithful witnesses that live to proclaim him. How then can we actually expect God to pull this off? For that, let's look at our third part of the message today, or the third way that God wants to introduce us to his victorious weapon against unrepentance. Number three, the Eaton scroll is symbolic of the sweetness and bitterness of the gospel witness of the church. Repentance comes from hearing and believing the gospel message. There are many who hear this message in all its truth. For some, it is sweet. It makes us respond to sin with repulsion and to God with love and dependence. But for others, the gospel is bitter. It exposes darkness which many people love to pursue in their lives. Let's hear the gospel message as it is written in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. It says this, Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. We are great sinners loved by a greater God. For the repentant heart, the love and salvation of God are sweet, and the way that sin breaks the heart of God is bitter. For the unrepentant, sin is sweet, and the need for salvation from God is bitter. These are the two kinds of people in the world when it comes to the gospel. Which one? Are you? It does not matter what nation you represent, what language you speak, or what title you hold in this world. Jesus wants the gospel to go to all. How will people decide? How will you decide? If you are a person who turns to God in repentance, the Bible says that when we repent, times of refreshing will come from the presence of of the Lord. Is there an area in which you need repentance today? If so, repent. Don't wait. Why? Because God's victorious weapon against unrepentance is the gospel message. So the question you need to ask yourself is, if I wait, what am I waiting for? If a calamity cannot change the hearts of people, and the gospel message can, but there's nothing else we can wait for. The Bible is clear. The gospel is God's victorious weapon against unrepentance. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you so much for this uh, word we've heard today. Uh, we, we thank you with deep gratitude, God, that you are faithful to your people. Perhaps today we find ourselves a little bit surprised that acts of judgment and calamities will not change the hearts of the unrepentant. And Lord, that leaves us very sober that uh, judgments in the world albeit hard to, to endure, cannot sway the hardness of heart and the deception 
and those who are unrepentant. But the gospel can. The gospel is your victorious weapon against our repentance. And Lord, we look at our world today and sometimes we ask questions about why the church doesn't have the same influence it used to or why the, the numbers at church are, are declining or why there are so many people who have no concept of God or, or the Bible in our, in our world today. And part of it is we're not faithful in um, proclaiming and living out the gospel in the world. Yet you tell us in this text that that is the very weapon you will use to fight off unrepentance in the world. That there are those in our world right now who have not heard the gospel, but if they did, it would be sweet to them and they would repent. We're going to talk a little bit more about this next time we're together, but for now, Lord, we do ask that you would give us uh, the heart of Jesus Christ for the mission of, of saving and seeking out those who are lost. We don't save them. But through us, Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, does. And so, Lord, make us faithful and available to Jesus, that he might use us to reach the world. Give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us faith uh, to be men and women, Lord, who reflect your gospel in the world, through our words and through our deeds. For we pray this in Jesus' name. A word of benediction today. May the grace of the Lord and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.